Please make sure you shared. No, f me. I'll put that one in as an outtake. Mm. Hi everyone and welcome back to Rich Reviews and welcome to my series on horology where I talk about the watches in my watch collection and welcome to Felix. He's struggling a little bit now but it's Felix. It's one of my ragdoll cats. I'll put him down now. And today we're going to talk about my Rolex Two-Tone Daytona. First of all a little bit of history on the Rolex Daytona. First iterations of the Rolex Daytona were named Rolex Cosmograph. They didn't actually have the name yet. The actual name came from Daytona, Florida area in America uh, where they had a passion for speed and the actual Rolex Daytona was designed around racing drivers who raced in the Daytona, Florida area. First iterations of the Rolex Cosmograph were developed in 1963. It wasn't until 1988 when a, an automated winding mechanism was put into the movement. First iterations of the Rolex Cosmograph or Rolex Daytona were manually winding. They never had an automated winding mechanism. The automatic winding mechanism was introduced in 1988 with the introduction of the Zenith El Primero movement or the actual movement based on the Zenith El Primero movement. And this movement also had a vertical clutch. Now what the vertical clutch enables you to do is in effect incorporate the the chronograph mechanism without any loss from the power reserve and also it means that because the chronograph system is integrated into the actual movement it's not a separate um, modular movement with with Rolex and with the El Primero movement it was an integrated it was an integrated chronograph it meant that the actual mechanism for the chronograph when you actioned it it meant that the mechanism um, the cogs were already moving um, and therefore the actual get system would engage uh, vertically and uh, in effect you're just letting the second hand start it was it's not actually engaged with the mechanism but it's just the actual hand as opposed to the actual chronograph mechanism so the hand would just then start moving we, therefore there was no additional wear and tear on the movement by having the chronograph hand moving all the time this you can do with vertical clutch systems with horizontal clutches what you're actually doing is meshing gears and you get a slight sometimes a slight um, flick on the actual second hand when you engage a horizontal clutch system and of course you're engaging more gears when you actually start the chronograph so you, you're introducing additional wear into the mechanism uh, when you're using the chronograph so when you're using if you're using the chronograph all the time on a, on a horizontal clutch chronograph then you're introducing more into this more wear into the system 
therefore you're probably going to have to get your watch serviced on a more regular basis than a chronograph with a vertical clutch if you use the chronographs all the time. So obviously it's better to have a vertical clutch in summary. <laughs> the first in-house movement was introduced in 2000 and this was reference 116520 and this was actually named the movement 4130 and this is where Rolex finally went fully in-house with the movement. Now I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, let me know in the comments below, I believe the movement became in-house because they actually purchased the movement that they were implementing at that time. It wasn't the El Primero movement obviously because the El Primero movement is still used for the El Primero models. A very famous Rolex Daytona is known as the Paul Newman because it was worn by Paul Newman and made famous by Paul Newman. It was purchased for him in 1963 by his wife Joanne Woodward and she famously put an inscription on the back of the watch which um, in effect said drive carefully me so obviously she was saying drive please drive carefully because she knew he was a racing driver and loved driving fast and it was from her so she put me on there and this is a very famous inscription very famous why well because this watch was passed on to his daughter's then boyfriend who subsequently still stayed a very close family friend he passed it on to her boyfriend his daughter's boyfriend and his daughter's boyfriend sold the actual watch he auctioned it i believe it was auctioned at sotheby's again correct me if i'm wrong in the in the comments below and it was sold at auction for an incredible amount of 17.8 million dollars at the time at the time that was a, a very large amount it wasn't the largest amount for a watch but um at still an extensive amount and that obviously made that watch very very famous the design of the paul newman watch was one of the special series of dials it was um, like a cream white background dial with dark colored uh, sub dials and i believe that is now known as the panda my rolex daytona is the 116503 and it's the two-tone which is gold and stainless steel rolex daytona with a black mother of pearl dial now the black mother of pearl dial is a special order into geneva into rolex geneva and it this had to be specially ordered and specially made it has the black mother of pearl dial as i mentioned also known as the tahitian dial and this dial has a mother of pearl thin slice of mother of pearl which is used to create the dial there's a lot of errors when they actually create this dial therefore it's actually quite expensive i believe the dial option alone was an additional £2,000. If you look at the subdials, you'll notice that the subdials have ground gold in them. So the subdials are made up of ground gold, which is again, very, very special and very rare. It also has, it has diamonds on the hour markers or most of the hour markers, not all of them. At the quarter markers, it doesn't have diamonds. I wasn't too fussed about the diamond markers. The key thing that I was after was the black mother of pearl dial because it looks stunning. And hopefully you can see the colors there. But as you move it around in the light, it changes colors all the time. Now the actual markers aren't that legible. The reason I got this, this Daytona watch purely because it's, a, it's a, a, an item of beauty. I didn't buy it to actually specifically read time. If you want to read time accurately, then really you don't look at a, a watch nowadays, you look at your phone. But I bought this for, for it being a beautiful timepiece and for the beautiful dial. The dial is everything on this Rolex Daytona. As you can see also, it's got center polish links which are in solid 18 karat gold as well. And the gold is made from Rolex's own forge. They have their own smelting works. Um, the reason they do that is so that they actually ensure the quality of the gold. They weren't happy with the outside quality that was that was being provided, so they made a decision to have their own smelting department and own smelting equipment, um, and so they actually forged their own gold. Some history on my Rolex Daytona. Now, this Rolex Daytona I bought um, approximately uh, four years ago, but previous to this Daytona, I had another Daytona which was had the white mother of pearl dial. Even though the white mother of pearl dial, any mother of pearl dial on the Rolex Daytona is quite rare, I wanted to go for the even rarer version, which is the black mother of pearl dial. And I just loved when I saw the pictures of it and I'd seen, I, I managed to see some other 
Rolexes, which had a black mother of pearl dial, although in a, it, that was very, very hard in itself, and they were very, uh, very different to the actual Rolex Daytona. I took a chance and I ordered the Rolex Daytona with a black mother of pearl dial, and I wasn't disappointed. I think it's absolutely stunning. And you'll probably see if I bring it up really close, probably see there's some marks on the watch and scratches. Well, that's because this is very much um, my regular worn watch. This is my, if you want to call it a daily, I do switch around other watches and wear other watches. I've got various of them, you know, for example, my 806, my Breitling 806 and um, some other watches, some other Breitlings that I've got and some other um, Omegas as well that I've got, which we'll talk about in some other videos. But this really is my, is my daily beta. This is my regular watch. Why? Well, because I just love that mother of pearl dial. And, you know, I'm not worried about putting any marks on it. The, um, the Batman that I discussed earlier, I'll worry about, you know, that's the watch that I keep safe, that I keep in the safe, and that's the watch that I, I look for accruing value. Um, this Rolex Daytona, even though it costs more, a lot more than the, than the Batman, this is the watch that um, I'm not gonna get rid of. Um, I, I will keep forever, hopefully. Again, you, never, you can never say never, but uh, hopefully I'll never ever have to sell this watch. You unscrew the crown, you unscrew the crown to its first stage. From there, you can manually wind the watch. Now, in general, you don't use the manual winder on an automated um, mechanical watch. You use the automated system, so you just use the manual winder to get the, get the watch started. Usually, the manual winding mechanisms on mechanical automated watches or automatic watches aren't very resilient they aren't designed to be used extensively so you should use them as little as possible um, and you should just use the automate the automatic winders in them as soon as you've got the watch going so you can unscrew the crown you unscrew the crown to the first movement i'll try and do it with my other hand so excuse me i'm doing it a bit cack handed here because i'm right handed not left handed and from there you'd wind it manually using the normal winder and then from there you can pull the watch out to actually the first stage to be able to set the time. When you pull the, the crown out to its first stage, it's got hacking, so it will hack the second hand. What hacking means is the actual second hand will stop. So if you want to set the time accurately, you wait until the second hand hits the 12, 12 o'clock position, the fully vertical position, and then from there you pull the crown out to stop the second hand, and then you can set the, the time, the minutes and the hour hand on the, on the timepiece and then you can obviously push the crown back in and when you push the crown back in it switches the hacking off so the second hand will then start again so obviously you can align that with an accurate um, time point so you use your, your phone or you can use an, an accurate time system to be able to then set your watch accurately. Screwing the crown to actually engage the gaskets which which seal the, water, the watch and make it water, water resistant. Um, you can notice you've got screw down crowns also on a chronograph the screw down crowns, same reason, they seal it, help to seal out the watch. You should never make any movements on the crown or on the pushers on a, on a Daytona with the watch underwater in any way, shape or form. And in general with this sort of watch, even though it's supposed to be waterproof to a certain, to a certain depth, um, I think it's 100 meters, but I'm not absolutely sure it might be 150 meters. I think it's 100 meters though. Generally, you know, unless you're very wealthy and or even if you're very wealthy, you just wouldn't, wouldn't really put a watch like this in, in the water you know why would you you know you can just take it off and hopefully leave it somewhere safe um, but just to go through the actual start and stop procedure with the pushers you start the chronograph by pressing the top crown you see there it's a really solid push and then you can say use the same button the first pusher to actually stop the chronograph running and press it again to actually start the chronograph running and then you can stop it again, and then after you've stopped it, you can use the last pusher, the bottom pusher, to actually reset the chronograph. Do I use this to time anything? Well, sometimes I do, but because the watch is all about the dial, and the dial actually doesn't make the, the markers very legible because it's a black mother of pearl dial, um, it, you know, it's very hard actually to see very accurately what the, what the time is. But as I said, again, this watch isn't about reading the time accurately if you want to read the time accurately you use your, your mobile phone now looking at the watch there racing drivers early racing drivers did actually use their Rolex Daytonas for timing for racing obviously 
um, when you use the actual chronograph itself, you can use the watch to provide elapsed time. So obviously you can time an event, so you can time a race or time a sub part of a race. And also you can try using the tachymeter on the outside, which is on the bezel, on the bezel on the outside. You can actually use it to calculate average speed as well, which is why the tachymeter is set up as it is. Remember, this watch was developed in 1963. We didn't have all the electronic systems that we have nowadays. Nowadays, you can just say to your phone, hey Siri, what's the average time for such and such? Or, hey Siri, you know, start a, start a stopwatch or set an elapsed timer, etc. You know, it's actually, stopwatch. It's actually engaged in my, my son's phone here, just by me saying that. For some reason, it always engages his and not mine whenever I say, hey Siri, but go figure, hey, that's Apple products for you. So yeah, you, you, just, you just wouldn't use a timepiece like this nowadays in modern times you wear you wear these you buy these timepieces for what they are a fantastic feat of engineering and um, for a thing of beauty okay so this is this has been a, a discussion about my Rolex Daytona if you want some more detail about the actual Daytona some some more intricate detail then maybe you want to go to websites like Bob's watches um, or actually obviously to the Rolex website in itself uh, to get some more details. Also Wikipedia has some details there about the specifics and more uh, granular information about dates and times and such like. Please look at my other videos on horology and, and also videos on my channel uh, with regards to my, um, my previous 993S and my Ferrari 458 that I've got up there now. And um, 458 in the garage still, by the way, if anybody's interested, just a little bit of update. It's still in the garage, um, sorting out, getting a new sectional front garage door on the garage so that it's wider, so it's easy to get the 458 in and out of the garage. But we have like monsoon weather at the moment in the UK, which is very standard for this time. We're moving into winter. Um, so the car's not gonna be used much over this period of time. It'll only be used on, on some very nice days and it'll be kept predominantly in the garage. Just a reminder as well that um, with regards to my previous video that I did on horology, which was for my GMT2 BNR Batman, that watch is for sale. So if anybody's interested in purchasing that watch, say is it unworn, as new, been in my safe since 2019 when I purchased it. It is uh, the pre update watch with the oyster bracelet the blnr oyster bracelet immaculate unworn and is for sale so if you're interested in in purchasing that watch then please drop me uh, a note in the comments below and uh, we can get in touch okay so that's my review on my rolex daytona so rolex daytona is just one of the watches in my watch collection i'll be reviewing other watches in my watch collection in future videos so please make sure that you subscribe if you want to see those other videos and please make sure you select like if you like the videos and please select all so you receive notifications of all future incoming videos. And please, if you like the video, then please share it amongst your friends. That'll drive content on the channel and help me to actually grow the channel and move the channel forward. Thanks a lot, everybody. Stay safe and see you in the next video.